women are tapping out. And I'm trying to invite us to build a more sustainable practice that works for the way that we show up in our lives so that we don't tap out of the things that we actually truly want to do and show up for. You're listening to Make Some Noise Podcast, episode number 488 with guest Jada Selner. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you're here. I am doing a book giveaway. I wanted to get that out of the way right from the beginning before I forget, because sometimes I do these intros and there's supposed to be a book giveaway and I forget. So it's my guest today, Jada Selner. She has a brand new book that just came out. And if you head on over to my Instagram after you listen to this episode, I met Hey Andrea Owen over there. You will see a post in my regular feed, and that's where the book giveaway is going to take place. So we are talking about hustle culture. We're talking about burnout. We're talking about rest as we dig a little bit more into women's health. And please excuse the clicking noise that's going on over there. That is my eight-month-old German Shepherd puppy. I'm just glad she's actually chewing on things she's supposed to be chewing on and not my furniture or my leg. But at any rate, hey, Andrea Owen over on Instagram to uh, wishing you luck for a free copy of Jada's new book, which is called She Builds. I am really excited to introduce you to her in just a minute here. And a quick reminder for those of you that are interested in some guidance and some private coaching in some what I like to call uh, coaching, consulting, co-conspiring head on over to andreaowen.com slash apply. And we can, even just based on your application, help you figure out what would be the best next step for you. Uh, If it is coaching with me, or if it is coaching with one of my lead coaches, or maybe it's not your time yet. The application does not obligate you to sign up for coaching. Uh, But if you have taken an interest, we do have a couple of spots this fall. AndreaOwen.com slash apply. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Jada Selner is a best-selling author, business coach, international keynote speaker, TEDx presenter, poet, and the host of the Lead with Love podcast. She's the author of She Builds, the anti-hustle guide to grow your business and nourish your life. When Jada is not speaking on stage, you can catch her dancing to Beyonce in her living room or sipping on a chai tea latte by a cozy fireplace. She lives in San Francisco Bay Area with her husband, daughter, and dog, Beasley. So without further ado, here is Jada. Jada, thank you for being on the show. Finally. I know. I feel we, you know, we've had a rendezvous on the clubhouse and now we have arrived here and I'm so excited to clubhouse and the internets for about a decade yes. and yes and I'm I'm happy that it's come to this because you have a new book out and that's always so exciting and I can't wait to talk to you about a lot of the things you talk about and it's, it's called she builds the anti-hustle guide to grow your business and nourish your life which before you all stop listening those of you that aren't entrepreneurs Jada knows <laughs> We're going to talk about, you know, just hustle culture in general and what that has to do with with the people listening. Um, so, I mean, let's start there. You and I started talking about some pretty juicy stuff and you interrupted me and you're like, we need to stop. We need to start yes. recording this. But well, let me let me start by asking you, like, what what prompted you to write specifically about that? I know the whole book isn't about that, but yeah. I think it's, isn't it the very first chapter where you talk yeah. about hustle culture? Yeah. So just, yeah. I'm just going to, th- I'm just going to toss the ball to you and like, tell us, tell us what you think about that. Yeah. So yeah. Chapter one is detox from hustle culture mm-hmm. and really an invitation for us to unravel from really the patriarchy of what we have stepped into in trying to operate in work in the way that men have built and designed it to work for them, but it actually isn't working for women. Mm -hmm. So hustle culture isn't working for women, yet this is 
how we've been operating and showing up and how we do our work and the productivity of working 80 hour work week while then coming home and trying to tend to yourself, to your loved ones, like it's too much. And yet as much as we're carrying as many hats as we're wearing, we're constantly feeling like we're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. We're not earning enough. And it's this, just this constant chase for more. And all we do is move the goalpost further. And so we're constantly just in this rat race of constantly being on a treadmill. And it's what it's causing is overwhelm, stress, anxiety, and, and burnout. And I just, this is what's happening is we're tapping out. Women are tapping out and I'm trying to invite us to build a more sustainable practice that works for the way that we show up in our lives so that we don't tap out of the things that we actually truly want to do and show up for. I'm curious if, cause like from the outside, before I knew you personally, I had, you know, seen you from the outside and you were kind of an early adopter in terms of creating a quote unquote online business and back when, so your first book was um, about green smoothies, wasn't it? Didn't you yeah, co- co-authored yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that was actually one of my, mm, one of my hustle moments was actually working on that book, Simple Green Smoothies. It came out in 2015. Mm-hmm. We got our book deal. And so from book deal to pub date was 11 months. And I oh, know, you know, quick. as an author yeah. and we're also taking pictures and photos and recipe testing. Um, and I remember this one day when, uh, you know, the manuscript was like, it's going to print at 9 a.m. And so I had been up for over 24 hours. I was still in my yoga pants. I was laying in the li- on the living room floor with my laptop in front of me. And I remember watching my husband and my daughter walking out to go to school. And I'm still just like glued to my computer screen, just like on caffeine, like must finish this. And that you was- You had one been of up all moments. night working on it? Yes. Like oh all day, gosh. all night, all morning. Immediately now. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> and and also being a walking paradox, right? Of having this health and wellness business um, about like being healthy and vital. Here I am glued to my screen, not sleeping for over 24 hours and walking my kid, watching, not walking, watching my kid mm-hmm. head off to school that morning. And that was one of those moments of like, burnout is not an option. Like this can't, this can't be the way that I live or perform. And so now I have learned to ask for more time Mm -hmm. instead of like pushing towards those things. It's that it's not a sustainable way to live. And so, yeah, that's just one, one of the many moments. And for us to kind of think, I mean, for you, have you had one of those like (laughs) hustle. (laughs) (laughs) So many, mine look different. I, I am not the type of person who can actually keep working after a certain time. My brain starts to shut down and I, I I don't know if it's, if it's a certain type of, if it's because of my ADHD or maybe ADHD helps certain people be able to sustain that, but I just, um, it just stops working and then I start to get irritable and then it just all falls apart from there. I turn into like, I, I now understand why. Um, toddlers throw tantrums. Like that's, that's how short fused I get. But for me, it looked like, I remember my husband came home from work one time. I was, I just started my business. My, my kids were super little. I think I had also, I was at the end of my drinking career or was like just getting sober. And I fell face first on the couch, like my face in the pillows and just started crying and, and was like, I wanted it so bad but my body and my mind were break starting to break down. And I was like, I, I can't sustain this, even though I pushed and pushed and pushed. And I've had other moments like that. I've, I've probably had maybe four throughout the course of my career, but the worst one was during the pandemic where it was just, mm. it was the absolute worst. I talked about it on the podcast too, where I had to completely like, you know, <laughs> SOS, like wave the white flag, like I'm not okay type of thing. And it was also, this was tricky because I don't know if anyone else experienced this. There was a lot of colleagues of mine who were, who were seemingly thriving and they would get like their entire community on zoom and like taking care of everyone. And I'm like, I can't even take care of myself right now or my family, like I must be terrible at this. So that was the mindset that I went down 
which is that's a red flag of like that kind of inner critic thinking. So yeah, it's yeah, it's interesting because I think we all operated in different ways mm-hmm. during kind of needing to quarantine and me being more of an introvert, I was, I was like in a happy place of like, okay, this, you know, not happy of what was going on in the world, but just having this cocoon, you know, I had just been through a lot of grief in 2019 when my father had passed away um, at 59 years old. Then we put our dog, our fur baby who we had, you know, rescue puppy to 13 years old and had to put her down. Mm. And then, you know, my younger, um, my youngest brother, 16 years old, passed away in a car accident. So, Oh my gosh, I didn't know all of that happened at the same time. Yeah, it was within six months that all of that happened in 2019. So in 2020, I looked at that as a bubble Uh for me to actually heal and process my grief. Because when we are operating in hustle culture, we also numb out from actually paying attention to what our body, our emotions, you know, we're not tending to ourselves because we're constantly going Mm -hmm. that we can't even check in and tune in. Like, how am I feeling? What do I need? What support do I need? So in that season, it gave me an opportunity to really sit with my grief and process the trauma and then compounded trauma collective from everything that was going on in the world. But that's actually when I started to write and to allow writing to be a part of my healing process too. And it was more about healing for me than it was for the reader first. It was for me first to mm-hmm. heal and process my own grief and trauma. Sure. Well, well, that brings me to what I also want to ask you about, because you talk about the importance of asking for help and, and not just the asking for help, but in the first place, having a support squad. And I know from people listening, they've often talked about how difficult and challenging it is to not just make friends as an adult, but maintain those friendships. So yeah. can you talk about that and like what, what your support system looks like and, and any tips and or advice you have for those people listening who might really struggle in that area? Yeah. So I first want to just name that I didn't have any really like deep, consistent friendships until I was like almost 30. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it took me a long time to really step into being Uh, deeper with women. I've been married for 17 years. Um, And so I I have, I've learned how to do this. So I'm excited to, to share what has been really helpful for me, but I also just want to name how hard it was for me to like be deep and vulnerable and have that consistency and connection with other women Mm -hmm. in my life. Um, And so some things that have worked really well for me as I define support squad is I look at it in kind of three different buckets. So you have kind of your peers and colleagues. These are the people that are on the same parallel journey as you. You know, they talk about parallel playmates when you have like, oh, like the that. little kids, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's like, we're kind of, we're, we're like on the same journey. Um, we're struggling with the same thing. So you, you have that area. Those are, those are your friends. And then there's also support in, in terms of mentors and advisors. And you can have mentors from afar, even listening to a podcast or reading a book um, can be a mentor. It could also be someone who's kind of coaching you to uplift you in whatever your body of work is. And then a third part of support squad for me is also looking at our mental and emotional health too. Um, So having a therapist, a life coach, someone who's holding the totality of your emotional landscape and life and all the other parts. Because even when you have close, close friends, Sometimes you need someone where you can just talk the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just like be selfish and take yes. up all the space. Yes, take up all the space and be witnessed. Um, sometimes that's all it's, we just want to be witnessed and heard. So I really look at it from a holistic lens of a way that we are growing with our mentors and advisors. We're playing with our peers and our friends. And then we're also healing and being witnessed and seen and having that safe space to be witnessed through coaches, healers, therapists, and things like that. So I really look to be supported in that whole way. Um, but as far as friends, I am, I am for me, I am a professional friend now. Like I am so good at it. So I'm excited to, to share. Um, so for me, I, the way that I build consistency with, with friendships is actually scheduling it. And I think for ambitious women who, you know, tend to do a lot of things, have a lot of things on their plates, usually work can over kind of flood 
your mm-hmm. schedule. Mm-hmm. And so for for us, if we, if you were if you identify as that 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 actually you need to schedule the things that you say matter to you, and it feels counterintuitive to do that because you're like, if it matters to me, I should just do it. Right. Like if it matters to me, I should just want to work out or move yeah. my body or just but it's actually, organically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but you actually need to be really intentional with the things that you say matter to you. So even with my family, well, I like I love my my daughter, <laughs> my husband. And yet I need to schedule time in. Otherwise, I will I will flounder. I will daytime couch time. I'll just veg. I'll watch all the shows. Like I'll just get lost in my own world or I'll get lost in my creative projects and work. So I have to schedule that time in just to make sure that I'm touching those things that I'm saying that matter to me. So with my friends, what I've done, um, you know, there's the old book, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon. Uh, I was going to say Napoleon, Napoleon Dynamite. I was thinking the yes. same thing. <laughs> Napoleon, Napoleon Hill, Napoleon right? Hill. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> There's Bonaparte Hill and Dynamite. Which Napoleon? Yes, is yes. <laughs> so Napoleon Hill, he talks about the mastermind, right? Where two minds come together and then they create this like magical third mind. And so I am always looking for people that like my friends that they're going to help me grow. So whether it's, I used to have, be a part of mom groups, I would start mom meetup groups and mm-hmm. just, I, I had a thing called Ohana Mamas. So kind of creating like some structure around friendship for, especially if you're more introverted can actually help. Um, so for me, I do a lot of masterminding with my business friends and I have several, like I have one that's local where I meet with my friends once a month on a Friday, we have lunch and then we have hot seats, which are like you know, dedicated 25 minutes of time to talk about whatever you're struggling with. Um, and then I have a group of girlfriends or there's eight of us that we meet once a year. Mm-hmm. And usually it's like in January and we schedule schedule that to meet. And then I have a friend who I call my Polly Pocket, um, where we vox on a day-to-day basis. So like finding kind of the what are the structure containers of support that you need? Or maybe it's just getting on a, a phone call with someone once a week. I had a friend, it was like a Tuesday at eight o'clock. We would just like share what we were working on. We were both moms. And so it's that it's the calendaring and the scheduling of it that can really help. Mm-hmm. But before you get to that place, you actually have to do something that I call 10 seconds of bravery which is actually like court somebody and ask them like on a date. On a date. Like, yeah. (laughs) yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing that we have to get comfortable with is micro rejections. So if you invite someone who you've not hung out a lot with before and they're like, oh, I'm I'm busy. I can't make it. And so we kind of get, what do I say, deflated from that response. Yeah. Mm Yeah. <laughs> and and so then we're like, okay, they're not interested. But right. what I do is like, hey, I would love to hang out with you. Is it okay if I like invite you to something in the future? So you're kind of planting the seed. Right. I'm going to keep inviting you and then they can opt in like, yes, please. I do want to hang out with you. Or if you're the person on the receiving end of the invitation and you're, you do want to hang out with this person, then just say, I'm so sorry I can't make it, but please keep Invite inviting me. me. That's what I yeah. say. Yeah. Because that, if we don't do that, then we we get into this place where we put our walls up and we're like, okay, they're not interested. And we we give up on the friendship. And I've also mm-hmm. been super explicit with friends where I'm like, I want to go deeper with you. It's so awkward to say that. I give that and it's also, all the time. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is but awkward. But it's like, yeah, it's like the, the note, right? Like, do you want to be friends, BFFs, like circle mm-hmm. yes or no? Like it's, we really have to put ourselves out there and, and not every person is going to become a deep, meaningful person, but we need those consistent touch points. You can't just invite someone once. It's like, you have to keep doing it over and over again. I have a new person that I'm courting right now, actually. And <laughs> yeah, but we, but we scheduled a like a, a hike and and several weeks ahead and then something came up and we can't do it. So now we're having to re, so there's this like messiness that comes with kind of building those friendships of like, Oh, we didn't get that on the calendar. We got on the calendar and life happened. And so we have to reschedule and navigate, but you have to put in that type of messy work of calendaring and scheduling to get it on and it'll get more comfortable and easy. But part of our brains don't know that we like, like hanging out with 
this person yet. So it's easier to just like stay in your pajamas and stay at home. Sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that gets lonely. Like the pain of that gets more so than the, the pain of, of practicing that 10 seconds of courage. Like you say, I'm, I'm actually in the process, something similar to you. So kind of a two part quick story. I had a friend that I met when I first moved here many years ago. And this is definitely one of those Dr. Maya Angelou, when she tells us, like, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. This person yeah. told me explicitly, she was like, I, I have friends, but I don't do like that, you know, what did she say? She's just like, I don't do like that soul sister bestie type <laughs> of thing. So at me being the good codependent that I am, I was like, I don't believe you. Like, <laughs> I'm going to win you over. Watch it. Watch how good of a friend I am. You're going to love me. And then years later, she was right. And we had this misunderstanding and then we didn't talk for a while. And then I reached out and was like, can I clean this up? And then we had a good heart to heart and I apologized and she apologized. And then a few months later, she did the exact same thing to me. And I'm like, okay, I'm seeing a pattern here and I need to just, I need to just put this to bed. So now I'm at a place where I am same as you. I'm like, okay, I want more local friends that are similar to me. And so I'm a part of this Facebook group that's that's local. I think, is it moms or just women? I can't remember, but it's like a progressive, like we all have this share the same political beliefs and I'm in rural North Carolina. So it's tricky, mm, you know, like, yeah. it's tricky. And so they're having a meetup and I RSVP'd yes on Facebook. And you know, you can like see who else is going. So of yes, course, like yes. any human, I'm like looking at other people's profiles and I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to have a lot in common. I'm like older than everybody else. So then I'm like, I don't want to go if I'm going to be, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be the oldest one there. And then I was like, Andrea, what would you tell a client? <laughs> and what, what would you tell them? I would tell them like, if you want the thing that you're after, you have to do, you have to do, take the action and the behaviors in order to get there. Like, do, and this is the same, like for a while, many years ago, I wanted six pack abs, but do I want <laughs> to do the things that it takes to get six pack abs? No, I don't. So it's like, you have to get clear on the thing. And so the friendship thing, do I want it bad enough to where I have to do uncomfortable things? Yeah, yeah. I do. This is very different than six pack apps. <laughs> so have you gone to the, the meeting? No, it's yet? next okay. Saturday and it's going to be tricky because I have another event in Charlotte during the day. So it's going to be a tight squeeze. Yeah. I know what might end up happening is that it's going to be the afternoon. I'm driving back from Charlotte and I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go. I'm tired. I've been up since six. And now that I've said it here on the podcast, you're going I'm and going. you're going to message me. I want to know about it. <laughs> and I do want to say something about meetup groups too, because, you know, when I first started Ohana Mamas it, and that group is still going on in Kauai, I don't live in Kauai anymore. I'm in California, but I remember people would RSVP and say yes. And then only one person would show up. And mm -hmm. so the person <laughs> so running just, it now makes us pay. Oh, RSVP. I love that. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. They that's <laughs> but <laughs> but, when, yeah. but don't not do it because only one person is coming. Like show up anyways. And that person became my best friend on Kauai oh and our daughters were so close and all like, so it's okay. Cause I, I have this big fear and I still have it right now as I'm, you know, inviting people for book party launch mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm like, no one's going to come to my party. So oh why even gosh. like host One of it? My biggest fears. Yeah. <laughs> but like, it's okay. And so sometimes all you need is just that one person and just know that that is enough to have a party, like two people. And also, I mean, you could party with yourself, but I'm just saying, even if the show up, the invitation is small and it's only one person still show up for it. Don't cancel the party. It's just so important. I appreciate you spending some time talking about that. I, I think I wrote about this in my third book. Like another way, I just want to leave this with people before we move on to the next topic is if you are struggling to meet friends, like ask, just like relationships, ask people in your life to set you up. Like if you have a partner, mm. ask them, hey, is there any coworkers that you have that might that are similar to me that, that might want to, you know, like hang out? Even if it's like you go with your partner to, the office party and your partner is like, Hey, I want you to meet my significant other. She's, you know, you guys have a lot in common and it might be like awkward, but it's just, it, it's like, we have to really sort of sometimes think outside the box, not just think yeah. outside the box, but, but dance outside the box. You know, yeah. like, I don't know if that's a real expression, but just yeah. step out of your comfort zone. And is what I'm trying to say. 
And compliments work too. So whether it's a private message or a DM, like complimenting people can get the conversation going, but also in person. That was the advice I gave my daughter when she was starting ninth grade, first year of high school. Just compliment people when you see something that you like or you think that's cool, Mm -hmm. say it out loud. And that creates a tiny moment of connection. My daughter made friends that way. She just, well, she's a seventh grader this year and her very best friend went to a different school. And so she was so nervous about starting school and that's what she did. And now she has a friend. Um, Mm. So yeah, that's it. It works. It works whether you're in seventh grade or ninth grade or you're an adult. One question that I have for you that I think might be helpful and the wealthiest people are those who are rich in relationships. And so I just feel that it's so important for people to prioritize this. But have you ever experienced where you were a part of a friendship or a group where it's like, ah, something's not quite right. Or like it served me in this season and now it's Mm -hmm. not anymore. Have you Mm -hmm. ever experienced where you've had to like step away? Yeah. I mean, I experienced that a lot as someone who, I mean, I'm a reformed party girl and I don't ever regret that. I know that there are some people who are in recovery who their partying days were just detrimental to their physical health, to their mental health, to their relationships. And that wasn't my experience. I had a really great time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it worked until it didn't. And then, but when, then I was, when I was drinking alone, that was a very different experience, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's for sure. I had to step away from those relationships. And part of it was because geographically we moved. And then I I think what people underestimate, and I don't know if this is where you were going, but I think it's important to add, I think we underestimate the grief process mm. of um, of that. And nostalgia for me is a heavy emotion and I can get so caught up in remembering and also romanticizing like, mm. you know, like old glory days, you know, it's like, want to watch me throw a pigskin over the mountains, like, type of thing. <laughs> like <laughs> speaking of Napoleon dynamite. But um, I just, I think that I'm, I want to give people permission to really grieve whether it's your identity when you were maybe a single woman before you had all the responsibilities you did now, or Mm. um, maybe it is old glory days or just the friendships that you, you know, because oftentimes before we have responsibilities, our friendships are a priority. And I I just have found that there's so much grief in that, that not a lot of people talk about. Yeah. Because it's the shifting identities. Mm -hmm. I, I also noticed for me something around reciprocity because I'm a very, like, I'm like a stage one clinger with friends because okay. I'm I'm very like, I can be alone and on my, my own. So when I find someone that I connect with, I'm like, I'm all in. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, but when I notice there's not the reciprocity and I won't feel that for a while, but if I'm like, oh, I think I'm giving or I'm showing up, I'm holding space more than that person is. So I'm also paying attention to my own needs or what requests that I need to make. But sometimes there's been places where I'm like, you're just not showing up in the same way that I, that I show up and love and give. And so those are, there's some seasons where I've had to kind of like separate the depth of relationship or how deeply connected we are just to kind of protect that part of myself. So I also want to say it's okay to step away from friendships that are no longer kind of fueling you or inspiring you in that form or shifting Mm -hmm. how often you give of your time because our time is so limited. Right. Well, actually, I'm curious now about that. In those situations, do you put that all on you? Like you're giving too much or do you sometimes get that 10 seconds of bravery and have the conversation first or does it depend? Yeah. So I definitely get real and honest with myself, like what's happening, owning my parts. But I, 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 you know, I had a conversation with a friend and I just noticed there was like them kind of dipping out and then coming back in only when they needed help, but then they weren't around. (laughs) And so, and it was actually really uncomfortable for me. Like I felt that like feeling in my chest, that like small part of me. And, uh, but I had to have that conversation, like this isn't working for me anymore. Can we hop on a convert? So have a call. So that 10 seconds of bravery to actually have the messy and uncomfortable conversation. We're still friends. Mm -hmm. We're just not in that deeper, closer, consistent container because she couldn't show up in the way that the, and it was a group of us. So um, couldn't show up in that same way. So we kind of just dissolved that group. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're still good friends. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like, it's kind of like, but this, this, the way that we're showing up 
is not working anymore and we have to shift it. Um, and I think it's also very beautiful and brave to to say what's real for you versus kind of it's like when you start to feel that resentment or you're complaining of like, mm-hmm. oh my God, that person does that, you know, and you're doing it to everyone else and not saying it to them. That's when it's like, okay, I need to have that a brave conversation and actually talk to them about it. Yeah. And just communicate and express your needs. And like it's and also it was one of those things where it's like, we've told you so many times and it's oh, not okay. You know, like okay. and it's still you're still showing up in that way and it just doesn't feel right. And so there's that a difference. Really, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you for clarifying because like for the record, I have been that friend <laughs> that you described. And it, my, my girlfriend who was one of my very best girlfriends, and I actually wrote about her and how to stop feeling like shit. I can't remember what chapter it was, but when I talk about there was this friendship that I had and she, it just kind of fell apart and I didn't know what happened and she kind of ghosted me. And then And then we kind of got back together and then she like really broke up with me and told me she just couldn't handle, she had a lot on her plate at that time. And then when we did finally talk about it and I was like, what happened? And she said, you were a selfish friend and uh, you know, you always managed to make it about you. And at first I was just mortified and just the, the wash of shame of, Oh my God, like I don't think she's wrong. Like I think right. I think she's right. And like, granted, it was a lot of that behavior on my end was at a time when I was going through my divorce, when I was like dating the addict who lied about having cancer. So there was a mm. lot of drama going on in my life. Yeah. And and but I I'm so grateful to her. And she has since said my delivery at that time was not the best. Like she's like, mm. I could have delivered it it better to you. And um but she was right. And I, that moment was such a turning point for me because it, uh, it gave me the jumping off point that I needed to look at how I behaved in a friendship. I always thought it was enough that I was entertaining, that I was always a good time. And that I was like 95% of the time reliable. Like I, you know, you could rely on me. Like if I said I was going to go out with you on Saturday night, like we were, we were going out, but it's not, you know, and I think many of us get to a certain point in our lives where we want more from our friendships and you know, we're done gossiping. We're done all of the things that many of us and the behaviors that we engage in. And it was, you know, one of the top 10 hardest conversations that probably both of us have ever had with each other, but you know, this was maybe five or so years ago, we sat at the Brigantine and just cried about Mm -hmm. uh, our former friendship and how, you know, that really hard conversation that we had. And she apologized for her delivery. I apologized for being a shitty friend. And, but I'll tell you what, I'm a different friend now based on that conversation. And and I had to really learn. I just, I don't think we're born with the ability to hold space for other people, to have empathy, to have compassion, to, to hold someone in the way that we want to be held. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times we have to have these conversations. Like it just, and it's crappy too, that, that we think that, and I feel terrible that in 52 ways to live a kick-ass life, my book, I wrote about like, get rid of your toxic friends. It's like, yeah, (laughs) I, I, I don't think that people are toxic. I think sometimes our behaviors are shitty and that we need to set boundaries, but also give people the opportunity to clean it up. Yeah, That's the part that's missing. And I have been guilty of that too. How would you have someone actually have that type of cleanup, that opportunity to clean it up? Like what would someone You mean if like you or someone, so if it was like you where you were feeling like your friend doesn't receive. Okay. So how I would say it is I'll, I'll go back to like the conversation that, or the sort of situation that me and my friend, I don't want to use her real name, although she would probably be fine with it. I'll, I'll call her, um, I'll call her Jessica, not her real name. So if Jessica were to come to me and say, Andrea, uh, I know you have so much going on in your life and it's a heavy load that you're carrying. And at the same time, when we get together, I feel like you're not, there's not enough room for me. I feel like most of the time you, I share something and you turn it around and make it about you and just kind of overstep it. And I know that that's not your intention to be not a great friend, but that's what I'm feeling. And I love you so much. And I love us so much. And I don't want this friendship to go away but it's, I'm not getting out of it what I need and I deserve. And I wanted to have this conversation with you because I love you and I want to continue and I want to give you the opportunity to improve. 
I love that so much. I feel like everyone should rewind. You can use my script. Out. Yeah, and that's just it. I'm shooting from the hip. But like, would I would that still feel like she punched me in the face? Yes, and okay. it, and it would feel like she punched me in the face and then gave me a big hug afterwards and a ice pack. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I love that. Because <laughs> there's no easy way to tell someone or to set a boundary or have a hard conversation. And I think as women, we're, we are inclined to be so nurturing and to take care of other people's feelings before our own, whether the person that we ta- we're talking to is male, female, or non-binary. Like that's even hard for me to say to somebody, all of that, of course. but it's important. And I also think that if you are living, you know, having a lot on your plate, going through a lot of messy transitions to name it out loud. Mm -hmm. So your friends know too, like, Hey, I know I'm taking up more oxygen in this season of my life. We also, I have a rule um, with friends where we can press reset in like a Voxer message train where it's like, Mm -hmm. my life is so full. I can't catch up. I can't track. I can't stick like, you know, and just like, just say reset. So like, we know you didn't, you didn't hear anything that we yeah. just talked about for the last couple of days because you're in that busy season and then just allows us to know like, okay, your mm-hmm. life is full. And also we know you don't know what's going on with all the things we just talked about. So it's, yeah, it's give people humans. Some mm-hmm. Yeah. It reminds me of, did you watch the show Shits Creek? Of course. Of course. Okay, family. I, you yes. probably would. I love David and Alexis, their sibling thing that they have called, it's my turn to take a selfish. Yeah. That's what this reminds me of. Like, like it's, you took a selfish. Do you remember in 2013? Like, of course their selfish was ridiculous because this was the premise of the show, but that's what it reminds me of. I didn't mean to make this whole thing about friendships, but I think it's such a, a pertinent topic. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. <laughs> You guys know how much I love science and research. And did you know that research shows that sex is as mental as it is physical? So you need more than just an amazing vibrator. If you dog-eared that one sexy chapter in a romance novel, or you have that particular scene in a movie that you always fantasize about, Dipsy can help get you there in a new way. With Dipsy, you can skip straight to the good parts, if you know what I mean. And I think you do. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. And new content is released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories on Dipsy again and again, you can always find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness stories, and sexy stories that you can read. I absolutely love this app. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash noise. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash noise. Dipsy stories.com slash noise. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Wouldn't it be amazing if life came with a user's manual when you were born and then it gets updated as you get older so you would know how to cope with things. You could even give it to people that you're in relationships with, but unfortunately, that's not how life works. This is why therapists were invented, I believe. Therapy for me has been all about having a place to talk about my feelings. I like to process out loud, and I have found that incredibly helpful. And also, a great therapist will point out your blind spots and help you with new coping skills and just so you can feel empowered. And also, if you need to deal with trauma, that is the benefit of therapy. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. There are no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash kickass. That's betterhelp.com slash kickass. I want to circle back to your book, and I think it's in your chapter about refilling your well. Can you talk about tools and strategies that people can take away from this episode that when they're feeling stressed or exhausted, like what what can they do besides like 
take a bubble bath. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because we have to redefine and rethink self-care that mm-hmm. it's not just massages and facials and mani-pedis and a bubble bath. Wonderful. Yeah. And also some bodies can't fit in baths. So we yeah. also have mm-hmm. to think of like accessible, creative, affordable ways to take care of ourselves. And to me, I look at self-care as not just those luxury things, although I, I love those things and getting acupuncture, but also just these micro sips of nourishment too. So some simple things like if your eyes are glazing at the screen and Zoom fatigue or, you know, you can tell you're just kind of zoning out that your body can need just a little shift and a reset. So I like to step outside in the sun or even if it's cold outside, just a a state change in your body can also be a form of self-care. I also like to lay on the floor. Um, so I will have my back on the floor and I'll either prop my legs up on my couch or even up against a wall or mm-hmm. a door and just lay. And and my husband's like, <laughs> be like cooking. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm just like, I'm just relaxing. And, yeah. But it uh, it like activates our para, para, I always forget the, the para, parent. I can't think of the word, right? It's parasympathetic. Parasympathetic whatever. nervous system. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes thank you. Um, when I recorded my audio book, I, anything with like four syllables plus, I was like, oh, they're oh tricky. No. <laughs> you don't realize so, how tricky some sentences are until you have to record it perfectly. Yeah. So, <laughs> or even, um, so like laying up against the wall, you can even listen to like an instrumental song or just putting a song on. Like I have a fill in myself playlist where I'll just dance to a song. It could be a mix of Alicia Keys, Beyonce, just Mm -hmm. whoever I'm listening to, but just kind of activating our body and nourishing ourselves in that way. And I have a a menu, like a self-care menu. My daughter has one and it's posted on her, on her wall next to her desk of just things that are what Think about what are things that are nourishing for you that allow you to kind of disconnect from the busyness or the work or the stressors that are happening. So building out a self-care menu can be a very, very powerful practice. For me, I love sitting, I'll go in a hot tub. Like that's more than a bathtub. I'd like put me in a hot tub and I could sit in it for three hours and I have dates with my husband in a hot tub. My daughter will have dates and conversations in there and I'll also just soak in a hot tub solo, but really thinking of sustainable practices that kind of reset you quickly can be very, very helpful. And also self-care can also be friends too. Like yeah. who are, who are, who are, who are your safe people mm-hmm. to talk to and knowing who that is. And like, I, I, are you free to do a walk and talk? That's something that I do a lot with my friends of like, Hey, can we, can we schedule a time? Are you free right now? Or anything just like for me to move my body and be in conversation can also be an emotional release and also getting us to move a bit too. I love that. I, I, I do similar things. I was trying to think like, what are mine that I do that might be different from, from your list as an extrovert, (laughs) I, um, process out loud. Yeah. Sometimes I'll talk in a whole circle, whether I'm with my therapist or my best friend. And my best friend, Amy Smith, and I, we use Voxer as well. For those that don't know, it's a walkie-talkie app that's similar um, to WhatsApp or Marco Polo. And now we call it podcast episodes that we send to each other because it's like every detail of our life. Oh my and goodness. So, and I'm, even sometimes I'll be leaving her a message and it's like, I don't want to stop recording. Like, I'm like Yes. And it um, stops you at 15 minutes. Like, like what else happened? Well, I got a blister from my vans the other day. And it's, just- that it's so powerful though, to have that, that it's that power processing. There's not a, and I'm, you know, like I'm, I straddle more introvert, but I'm a, so, I'm a social introvert. And so I have one friend that can like do like we're basically daily dear diary to yeah, each other yeah. back and forth. And my husband's like, I want a Nikki. Like, <laughs> like, you know, like how, how, how do people get like a Nikki or what was your friend? Amy. Uh-huh. Amy, you know, like, how do you have someone that has that? If you are a verbal processor, it's really helpful to have someone in your corner that can process and share an update and it's reciprocal. I'm assuming that both of you are verbal yes. processors. And it's vulnerable. Like I I don't, and this did not happen overnight. This was a process yeah. that happened over years, but, um, and just to go back to one of the things that I've noticed about me as an extrovert, and this, ha- this has happened as I've gotten older is that I hit a wall and it's suddenly like, I'm done. 
Like, they're really, yeah, <laughs> I want, I wish that it was socially acceptable for me to be at a party or in the middle of a conversation with somebody and just say, sometimes I want that to be my sign off here on the podcast of just, I'm done talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I, 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 I'm a late diagnosed ADHD and I, my, my son has autism and the more I learn about it, I'm like, I definitely have some tendencies, but one of the yeah. things is that. I have learned to master masking of small talk. Like I don't mind it. And I think it's because I'm just good at it. But wrapping up a conversation is really where things fall apart. for me. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm done talking. But how that manifests in, in real life is that I'll get to a point during the day where I'm just done. I hit a wall and I have to go and be by myself in my bedroom and I'm like, no one come talk to me. And it's, and it's a way of just sort of hiding kind of, but it's a way of it's self-care. It truly is self-care. It means nothing about my family members, nothing about really my, my mental state, except that this is what my brain needs to take care of itself. Yes. And I, we, we, in our family, we do the same because my uh, daughter and I tend to be more highly sensitive and processing and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, I need space. Yeah. And that is the clue. Like I'm I'm closing the door. We have code words, all kinds of different words to use of like, please stop. My husband's a musician. So it's like, please stop playing the guitar. Please stop playing the Mm -hmm. digital, whatever the hand pan, like, just like we need the noise to be quiet. Um, So I need space is like a really great phrase to say. And then it's like, that means like, I'm going to go in the room, veg, close the door. I need to decompress. And something that I say in my book is I'm not hiding. I'm healing. Yes. Thank you. I love that. I'm not hiding. I'm healing. That's yeah. exactly how I describe it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like everyone should definitely get your book on audiobook because the sound of your voice is so soothing. Do people tell you that? Yeah, they do. Okay. So I was excited that I you, I could record the all my love and energy is definitely in the audiobook. And I feel like it's one of those things where you want the physical book and the audiobook. I'm, I'm one of those nerds mm-hmm. that like, because there's actually a lot of worksheets and questions and prompts in every chapter to kind of, and also to build your self-care menu in, in chapter 11 of Refill Your Well yeah. and getting some inspiration of like, what is your self-care style? Because mm-hmm. we, we, there's this, yeah, there's the, like the social butterfly or the solo lounger or um, the artist. Like there, there's just so many, like, how do we refill our well and kind of identifying with certain traits that might kind of help you build out your menu a little bit better. And usually we're straddling more than one thing, but it's helpful to kind of identify what is your self-care style. Got it. Okay. Definitely people check that out. The book is called She Builds, The Anti-Hustle Guide to Grow Your Business and Nourish Your Life. I feel like this could have been definitely like a two-part podcast episode. Um, You're just, you just, a a clear example of someone who's been doing the work for so long and also helping other people do it. And I just, I love your wisdom. I love the sound of your voice. I love your energy. Thank you so much for being here. Mm, I'm so happy to be here. And we we could do part two on my podcast. So you could, we we, we can continue the conversation on the lead with love podcast and then we'll do part two. I'd be happy to. So before we close up, is there anything that you want to circle back to that you're kind of, you know, feeling like you, you want to say, to be complete? Yeah. I just want to kind of revisit that 10 seconds of bravery of really thinking about what is that one thing, that one uncomfortable thing that is getting you closer to the thing you actually want. Mm -hmm. What is that 10 seconds that you need to do? Is it an email? Is it a compliment and a DM? Is it, you know, an invitation to a friend, a text message, just put yourself out there and see what happens from there. Mm. Anything is possible. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything is possible. Yeah, it could be it could be the start of something beautiful. Um, thank you so much for being here. And then where do you want people to go to learn more about you? I'm assuming it's to your book. Do you have like yeah. extras or anything? Yeah, we definitely have extras. If you go to shebuilds.com, you'll get all of the book stuff and also there's tons of bonuses and great things to get. Um, if you do that and then just for anything else that I'm up to jadaselner.com and at jadaselner and all the social media handles, but I can usually only handle one. Uh, You're so cute on Instagram. I can't like, I'm pulling my TikToks. It's great. You're just, 
Thank you. So fun to watch. <laughs> it's I, well, it's funny because it the difference of Instagram and TikTok. Like, I'm really not a big deal over on TikTok, but Instagram, <laughs> it's like, oh my god, that's so cool. And I'm like, then you should be on TikTok, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I know too many socials can be overwhelming. But again, I'm an extrovert, so I love it. I love it so much. All right, all those links will be in the show notes. Thank you so much again for being here, and everyone. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so grateful that you choose to spend it here with my guests and. And with me. And remember, it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye for now. Hey, did you know there's free secret podcast episodes waiting for you that are not part of my regular podcast feed? Yes. AndreaOwen.com slash free. And you just sign up. You get a link sent to you. It's very secret. It's like a secret club. We don't have a secret handshake. Don't worry about that. But it's these motivating podcast episodes that I made for you. They're under 20 minutes each. There's three of them. They're for wherever you are in your life. So head on over there and grab them. They range from really supporting you and seeing you where you are and being compassionate all the way to giving you a giant kick in your ass and telling you how amazing and gorgeous and phenomenal you are. So andreaowen.com slash free and get your hands on that free podcast feed. 